Part one. You will hear Bud and Annie talking about their families. Look at questions one to five. Hi, Annie. Yeah, how are things? Awful, Bud. Awful. Why? What's happened? It's home. Mum's ill, and Dad's been laid off, so he's in a really bad mood. And Susan won't be of any help. Your sister always was lazy. But what's wrong with your mum? She seemed fine last time I saw her. Everything. I think she's really down because of Dad. And her arthritis is playing up again. It seemed the new medicine was working fine. Now she can still move her fingers, but hardly walk. Her toes hurt, and the doctor says she needs a knee replacement. Doesn't sound too good. That's expensive surgery. Got medical insurance. She was covered by my dad's, but that's finished since he lost his job, and money's really tight. A new knee costs about ten thousand bucks. So she'll have to put up with it for a while. God, that's awful. Maybe I should mention it to my uncle, the one who used to work at the hospital. What could he do? I don't know, but he knows all the doctors, and maybe there's a way your mum could get the operation done cheaply. It'll have to be really cheap, 'cause they're having a problem paying the mortgage, and my sister won't help out. She's so selfish. Well, I'll give a try,、uh, but. What's this problem with your sister? Since she won that beauty competition, she thinks she's been acting so high and mighty. Won't even help Mum with the housework. Look at questions six to ten. Won't help your mum. No, spends all her time in front of the mirror, trying on different lipsticks. Sounds like my cousin. You know her, I think, Marianne, who works at the Holiday Inn. Yeah, I met her at your party, but she seemed very nice. She is till you get to know her, Miss Charming, but she's really conceited, especially since she got promoted. Always putting people down. What about your dad's company? Do you think he might have some work for my dad, part time, anything? He just got this big contract for the new supermarket, so he might be looking for some people. And I know he likes your dad, but all his workers have to be steel workers union members. I think Dad's kept his membership up. I'll ask him. Let me know, and I'll check with Dad when he gets back from France. France? Yeah, he took Mum there as a twenty-fifth wedding anniversary present. Gosh, it's five thirty. I'm late for work. Gotta fly. See you, Bud. See you. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a bank manager talking about money management. First, look at questions eleven to fifteen.
Good morning, everybody, and welcome to one of the Hong Kong's bank's lectures on money management. I'm John Rogers, and I'm the manager here. Money, they say, makes the world go round. Well, it is true that your world can come to a grinding halt if you have no money. I know you all agree, because that is why you have come here today. Okay, money. What do we want to do with it? Most people want to enjoy the money they earn today, but also put some aside for a rainy day, the kids' education, that big house in the country you've always dreamed of, and of course retirement. In other words, they want to invest it. So let's talk for a little while on spending money wisely today, and then I'll talk about the various types of investment you can make. The first question is. How much of your income should you enjoy spending today, and how much should you save for the future? And the answer is different for different people. It depends on things like age, your health, how many children you have, etc. Well, my initial answer is write out a budget for the necessities: food, rent, mortgage, and loan payments, clothing, health insurance, things like that. When most people do this, they say to themselves, "My goodness, I really only need to spend fifteen hundred pounds a month. So how come I always spend nearly two and a half thousand?" My mother used to tell me, "Look after the pennies, and the pounds will look after themselves." What to do? Discipline. I suggest you take out the cash you need every week from the bank. And keep a record of what you buy with your credit card, and you must strictly limit what you spend every month to, for example, your budget for essentials, plus an amount, say, ten percent for a bit of entertainment if you want, and the unexpected, like house repairs, that birthday present you forgot about, things like that. If after three weeks you find that you have nearly spent your budget for the month. Then stay at home for a week. No fancy restaurants or drinking with the boys. As they say, there's no free lunch. As the talk continues, answer questions sixteen to twenty. Okay, so what do you do with the money you don't spend? Oh, one thing I forgot to mention: it's a good idea to always have some money in a current deposit at the bank in case of big surprises, say a thousand or so. Don't be tempted to use your credit card unless you absolutely have to, and get that safety cushion back in the bank as soon as you can. Right. So, what should you invest in? The list is endless: real estate, stocks and shares, equity funds. Did I hear someone say gambling? Well, if you have a crystal ball, maybe. The government lottery? Someone once described it as a voluntary tax on fools, but I must admit I spend a pound or two on it every week, but no more. It brings a little bit of excitement into my life. Even though I know I have a better chance of being struck by lightning than winning. Okay, let's start off with a basic principle. In general, the higher the potential for making a fortune by buying shares of a particular company, the one you have been told will be the next IBM in three weeks, the higher the risk. We've all heard about the dot-com bubble of several years ago. Some people made a fortune, but they got out before the market crashed. The majority of investors lost their shirts. Another basic principle: the balanced portfolio. A balanced portfolio means you have investments in a variety of things, from low-risk but low-return things, 
to things like blue-chip stocks that are somewhat less predictable, but which will probably provide steady, if not spectacular, returns for years, to the riskiest of all, venture capital where success could increase the value of your investment a hundredfold, or failure could wipe it out. Well, why don't we break for a coffee now? Then I will talk about the most common form of share ownership. Common stock, which makes you become a part owner of the company itself, with voting rights and entitlement to dividend distribution, if there is one. That is the end of Part 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a college professor and two students talking about a course on shooting video projects. First, listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi, guys. Hi, Hi Professor, Professor Edwards. Edwards. What's, happening? What's happening? Well, the department head just told me I've got to teach this course on making video documentaries. I know you two are really into videos. That documentary you made last term on homeless people was fantastic, and I've never thought this course before. I'm an old-fashioned film man, so I thought I'd get some suggestions from you on how to design this course. Well, I don't know if we can be much help, but we'll try. How exactly do you think we can help you? I suppose the first thing is, how much do most of the students know about video cameras? I don't want to waste time telling them stuff they already know. Actually, some of them have video cameras, but they only use them for home movies, that type of thing. Yeah, I don't think many of them know much about their cameras, just point and shoot. So maybe I should start with the basics of the video camera. I think so. Otherwise, they will just put the thing on automatic and lose out on a lot of really good things you can do if you control the camera more yourself. I agree, but do you expect everyone to have their own video camera? Too expensive for a lot of them, but they can rent them. Doesn't cost too much. Five to fifteen pounds a day, I think. Depends on the model. The thing I'm most interested in is getting them to plan their projects properly and be creative in their use of what they've got. Doesn't the film department have some cameras students can use? I checked that out. They've only got three. Probably not enough. Do you think they need broadcast quality cameras? You know, three CCDs, expensive stuff. As the conversation continues, answer questions 26 to 30. No need. Single CCD. A bit of zoom. Wide angle for indoor stuff and scenery. Basic functions will do. You mean camera angles. Shooting from interesting positions. Creative lighting. That sort of thing. Kind of. But that's much the same as you teach in your film courses. Guess you're right. But I want to think of things you can do with a video camera that you can't do with a film camera. Aha! Secret shooting. Much easier to film people without their knowing with a tiny video camera than it is with a big film camera. Make a little hole in your pocket and off you go. And if you're not happy with something, you just erase it and do it again, if you can. Good point. But there's a question of privacy here. Is it fair to film people without their knowing? 
unless you're a cop or something. I suppose it's not, but it's often the only way to get what you want. I don't worry about these things. I just want to make good movies. Can't always do that if people know you're filming them. Well, I've never been taken to court for filming people without their knowing. But I agree. Sometimes you have to. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a lecture about various issues in land management and ownership systems by Professor Fred Roberts. You now have some time to read questions thirty-one to forty. Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all looking so full of energy. Today, I'm going to give an overview of some general principles and issues relating to land management and ownership. Very important. If we look at history, it seems that much of it concerns conflict over religion, economic power, and land. Often, all three factors are involved together. The first question one asks when talking about land is, "Who owns it?" What you can do with land you own depends on one's political views. A far-right conservative may say ownership is the socially supported power to do what you want with the land you own, with no control by government, as long as what you do with it doesn't hurt others. You can imagine how different factions interpret "hurt others." By contrast, the political left, socialists, and more to the left, communists say land ownership, private land ownership, that is, is the root cause of much injustice in the world, and. That the social protection of private land ownership can result in tyranny and oppression. They therefore argue for state, public, and cooperative forms of land ownership. I would mention here that most of us take for granted the idea that everything must be owned by a person, people, or an organization. But some societies, notably some native North American tribes, seem to have no concept of personal ownership. It was normal for them simply to take anything they needed. And for others to take it from them if they needed it. When European settlers came, the Indians behaved as usual, which led the Europeans to seeing them as thieves. But the European settlers grabbed the Native Americans' land, their most important possession. So who were the real thieves? However, in this day and age, it would be futile to think of getting rid of the concept of ownership. But let me return to land ownership. It's a complex issue. For example, should the owner have exclusive control over the rights of way, like traditional footpaths, or the migration routes of wild animals, or the ecologically important wetlands? Should the owner be allowed to destroy the whole lot by building expensive houses everywhere? Or what if the owner discovers hidden treasure that once belonged to the royal family? All such things raise questions of the rights of the owner as opposed to the rights of others, including animals, perhaps. Clearly, divergent views on such questions are a constant source of argument. What did the classical economists say about land ownership? Their positions were often rather ambiguous. Many of them seemed to consider it a necessary evil, and argued that it could not be defended if there was not some obligation to keep and improve the land. This is the concept of stewardship: that the land must be kept in good condition for future generations. But what if the owners were good stewards of their vast estates, but millions were going hungry? The Marxist answer was, and still is, land reform as a means of social justice. And in the twentieth century, I mentioned ecological issues just now. Other reasons for legally restricting the rights of landowners have emerged. You can't cut the trees down because it would cause soil erosion that can spoil rivers hundreds of miles away. 
Pollution, the need to protect biodiversity, things that reduce the level of what we called nature's services to the general public, all have led to more restrictions on landowners' rights, at least in some countries, especially Europe. At the same time, property taxes have steadily increased to pay for essential services offered by the state or local government, such as firefighting. As these threats to the health of our planet get more serious, some people have argued that the ownership of natural capital, forests, wetlands, etc., will more and more be controlled by communal and not by private bodies. For example, the use by multinational companies of native plant varieties for modified crops and new drugs, plants that they seldom paid for in the past, are now increasingly recognised as belonging to the cultures or ecosystems from which they originated. But it seems to me that having the land and its flora and fauna owned by governments is no guarantee that they'll be used wisely, rather than for short-term profit. The evidence is that local ownership protected by law is usually the best answer. OK, it will soon be time for a break, but before we have our coffee, I will give the answers to the two questions I asked you last time. What are the differences between leasehold and freehold? Essentially, the former allows possession for a limited time, while the latter is a special right granting the full use of real estate for an indeterminate time. In this country, most houses are sold with the land and the house itself freehold, whereas many flats are sold with a lease which was issued by the freeholder to the original leaseholder. The flat is then effectively owned by the leaseholder for an agreed number of years. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.